All right, we're going to be talking about Martha Nussbaum's um, idea of otherness in her works um, called In Not For Profit, from her works called In Not For Profit. Um, okay, so she begins the conversation with talking about the clash, the infamous clash of civilizations that everyone's talking about. And for her, the clash is an internal clash. Um, it's an internal clash of civilizations. The internal clash of civilizations can be observed um, through many struggles over inclusion and equality that take place in modern societies. And these are, she names popular um, kind of conflicts taking place in regards to this struggle over inclusion, such as immigration and religion and race and um, some of the some of the things that I think one that's popular today in America is definitely like the wage inequality can be seen as um, kind of a struggle over inclusion. And then from this, she goes on to uh, trying to find out kind of where it kind of starts and what proliferates this clash of civilizations, and for her it begins with by examining babies. Um, she states that babies become aware that they are helpless, um, and when they become aware, I mean, and the desire to transcend the shame and incompleteness leads to instability and much danger. So uh, for Newsband, we have this dichotomy between being competent and helpless, and our persistent desire to transcend these conditions um, is kind of what, what creates uh, conflict. Um, it's almost as if we are not accepting, or, or she talks about, actually, hold on, I'm gonna pass it over <laughs> to somebody else who's going to talk more about this. Hi, um. Well, she starts discussing as uh, babies are sort of an oasis where inequality forms, because when they are when they're born, you know, they're pure and empty, pretty much. And uh, she, uh, he understands that the very weakness and neediness of human infants give rise to a dynamic that can create ethical deformation and cruel behavior. So, pretty much, what they're saying is, uh, from birth, children desire to sort of enslave their parents because they become dependent on them and they need their parents to survive and they don't really look at them much as parents but as tools for survival and uh... The problem with babies having to have had um, sorry the problem with babies um, and their their need their the shame comes from them feeling incomplete or weakness uh, uh, feeling incomplete and feeling weak. The, the problem with it is that in our society we teach, we teach people that this is not normal, that they are ought to be perfect and ought to be self-reliant and transcendent and I guess for Newsbaum this is this is kind of what why people um, project their weaknesses and um, I guess she uses the word animality and mor mortality um, onto other people because we teach people that this isn't normal and, be and what, what Newsman is saying is that it is normal and so everyone does have these weaknesses and um, but we try to distance ourselves from it because our society kind of encourages it. Um, so here it is. So children learn from the adult world. This is how they learn how to distance themselves. They, turn, they learn from the adult world about where and how to project the disgust around them. Um, it's typically projected amongst subordinate groups. She calls them subordinate groups, which I thought was interesting. Um, but to different groups, such as Jews, African Americans, and homosexuals, and poor people. And um, our, also our culture sends these messages 
through like, you know, the self-made man. It's a very American thing, especially like the westernization of the world, this kind of individualism um, ideology. Um, and so the central part of the discussed pathology, she says, is the purification of the world into pure and impure, the construction of we and we who are without flaw and they who are dirty, contaminated evil. So this narrative is sealed and um, proliferated and reinforced through the storytelling of good guys versus bad guys. Now, then she talks about uh, the capacity for compassion. And this is kind of a way for us to get out of this, is compassion. Um, but there's a flip side to it. So she does believe that you know, teaching children the ability to feel concern and to respond with sympathy and, um, and imaginative perspective, she, she believes not just teaching it, that it actually is an inherent part of our evolutionary heritage. And so in a way, she, she gives us hope by saying that like, it's kind of part of us to feel sympathetic. And this is where she's drawing from Rousseau's idea of man in the state of nature. Um, and so children who develop empathy with the support of a good upbringing, good education are more likely to be less, to use their aggression, to not be as aggressive and to recognize other people as people who have rights. Um, but then she gives us a warning that to, we must cultivate compassion Cultivating compassion all by itself does not suffice. Um, it, it must become, an, it, because it could be an ally of shame and disgust. For example, people who just love people who are in their group. Um, and, you know, they feel like they're good people because they love people in their group, but they don't like the other still. So she's kind of warning us to be careful about that. All right. Um to continue more about compassion. Uh, she starts talking about how children come to feel gratitude and love towards separate beings who support their needs, which is um, adding on to when we were talking about parents being tools, since the parents like nurture the children and, and they give them what they need, that, that's where the compassion sort of like, get, get, um, gets birthed. And uh, Nussbaum understands that people can feel compassion under certain circumstances, for instance, it's easier to feel compassion for people you are associated with rather than for a stranger who you know nothing about. And uh, she was an example where they, they show lab tests about mice, right? And uh, these mice were, they were, um, hold on a second, all right, right. Uh, they were with other mice, right? And then they were, uh, there was a test where they showed the discomfort levels when they seen their fellow mice who they knew under pain, and um, the mice that they knew, they, they felt a good amount of discomfort for, but then when they did the same exact test with random mice who they were not associated with, they showed no levels of discomfort, which proves how people you're associated with, it's easier to have compassion for. And uh, children who understand sympathy and compassion understand what their negative actions have on people, and that's where guilt comes from. And guilt lets them know what they have done, you know, like it lets them know their actions. And, uh... Then uh, she starts talking about Mills and narcissistic desires and how to combat this. And this, this is also uh, Rousseau's kind of, um, came from Rousseau. And um, it sounds, it's, at least to me, it seemed like this narcissistic desire is also something that is bred through our society. And um, so she gives two points on how to combat it. And one is that he must become physically mature. He must learn not to be helpless, not to need to be weighted on hand and foot. And by this, it's not, it's not saying that he needs to um, not be completely be self-reliant. I think that th this idea of physically mature is, is the idea of not um, needing others, like not needing other people to, for instance, like servants or like, it's almost like you're creating an other because they're lesser than or something and they're helping you 
uh, do things that you can't do for yourself. And she's basically saying you have to, you have to not use people as tools, but you have to kind of grow into your own capacities um, to help yourself. Um, so to this extent, he is competent in the world, and he will have less need to call on others the way a baby does. That's just to cement more of what I was trying to say. The second point is um, his emotional education must continue through a wide, wide range of narratives. He must learn to identify with the loft of others, to see the world through their eyes and to their suffering vividly through the imagination. Which just means just basically kind of having the um, people experience other, what it feels like to be in somebody else's world and somebody else's shoes, kind of, kind of, ideally, I feel like if there's a way we can systematically create this, it would be something like the poor, the rich person goes and lives in the poor person's neighborhood in their house, in their, and, and, um, and, the, and the poor person goes into the other person's house, and like this way you can actually experience and understand what it means to be another. Um, and through this, only, and through this kind of, although she talks about it more in, edu, in the way of education, she talks about it like, which, I mean, I don't know, like when you, you're in class and um, you're watching the narratives from like the Holocaust, you know, that's kind of an example of education that is helping you to, to not only see what happened, but kind of perhaps develop an emotional connection to what happened and feel sympathy and feel the suffering and share the suffering of what what happened and that's how she believes you can combat Emil's narcissistic desire. Okay, and so this is pretty much what she ends it with um, is how to produce citizens for a healthy dem democracy and she has one, two, eight points of how to do this. She believes that um, this is kind of summarizes her whole argument. Um, so the first thing is to develop students' capacity to see the world from the viewpoint of the socialized, stigmatized other. Second, she says, teach new attitudes towards human weaknesses and helplessness that suggest weakness is not shameful and the need for others is not unmanly. And uh, thirdly, she says to develop the, the capacity for genuine concern for others. Um, both near and distance. So that whole idea of compassion needs to be not just me, but also the other. Um, and then um, undermine the tendency to shrink from minorities of various kinds and discuss thinking of them as lower and contaminating. So basically erase these kinds of concepts and ideas of how to be. Um, teach real and true things about other groups so as to counter stereotypes and disgust that often goes with them. So basically bring truth into the picture as opposed to projections and fear and lies. And then last but not least, promote accountability uh, by treating each child as a responsible agent. Um, and thirdly, I mean lastly, <laughs> vigorously promote critical thinking, the skill and the courage it requires to raise a dissenting voice. Great. Thank you.